I'm Ivo, and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Ambire Wallet. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about the future of Ethereum wallets and Ethereum UX. Uh, and two technologies are at the core of this, and that's uh, smart contract wallets, kind of also known as account abstractions, and uh, MPC, otherwise known as multi-party computation, uh, and sometimes referred to as threshold signatures uh, in this case. The question is, can self-custody be the future for the next billion users? How can we onboard the next billion users? And there's a big myth in the space that most people are not ready for self-custody. Uh, but the actual reality is that most self-custodial wallets are not ready for the users, not the other way around. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing, uh, can I get a show of hands who saw the account obstruction panel yesterday with uh, Vitalik? Cool, yeah. Um, so you all know that seed phrases are absolutely terrible and they're an absolutely terrible way of um, backing up your private key. Uh, and we have so many problems in the industry with compromised keys, uh, software wallets being vulnerable to malware and to, compro uh, to supply chain attacks, uh, which is quite scary, like a single NPM library can like, completely wreck your wallet security. Uh, and of course, you know, we have social engineering attacks, uh, like for example with uh, board apes. Uh, and uh, generally all of those things can be solved by um, multi-factor authentication and uh, on, on the chain we call this multi-sigs. And why are multi-sigs kind of a silver bullet? Uh, so first of all, by having multiple keys, uh, or you, you can think of it as multiple shards of a single private key, but it's actually multiple keys. Um, you can actually onboard users without making them write down a seed uh, and without worrying that they would lose access to their account. Um, so basically a simple example would be uh, to have a key on your laptop on, and on your phone. Uh, you can also recover your account with um, methods like uh, social recovery that Argent pioneered, but there's also other ways of recovery. Uh, you can also generally do multi-factor authentication, uh, which is way more secure and prevents you from malware. Uh, and of course, you have resistance to hacks and compromised keys. Uh, for example, if you have malware on one of the devices, uh, you would not be that vulnerable. So um, there are two ways to achieve a multi-sig on, on an EVM chain. Uh, one of them is uh, smart contract wallets, and a lot of you have heard about account obstructions, and account obstructions are basically a way uh, to pave the way forward for smart contract wallets, but I prefer to call this like smart, uh, smart contract wallets. I prefer to call all of these technologies uh, smart contract wallets or smart wallets for short. Uh, and this is basically where each account is a smart contract, which allows for any custom execution logic, uh, including multi six of course, and then MPC refers to multi-party computation, and in the context of wallets, um, it means that it allows you to have uh, like threshold signatures, so um, you can sign by, uh, the signature could be by multiple parties, or you can do N out of M, so like two out of three. Uh, and uh, let's start by busting some myths about smart wallets. So one of them is that smart wallets cannot sign messages, and I'm sure that many of you have heard that, but the reality is that smart wallets can sign messages just fine. You just need a bit of custom logic for verification, uh, which is EIP-1271. Uh, then another one is that smart wallets, and I've heard that in the past, that they produce a different address for each chain, so it's kind of um, tough to use. Uh, but that's not really true because you have create two now and you can create accounts counterfactually at the same address on all EVM chains. Uh, again, it was mentioned in the panel. Uh, and then the other one is the gas overhead. Uh, gas overhead still exists, but it has gotten a, a lot less in the last years, again, thanks to, um, uh, thanks to uh, proxies, uh, minimal proxies, um, and thanks to counterfactual deployment. Um, unlike MPC, smart wallets can do many more things than just multi-sigs. Um, they can do time locks, they can do spending limits, uh, again something that was fantastically covered on the panel. Uh, and this also allows for recovery mechanisms like social recovery um, and um, for example seedless onboarding uh, like we have on Ambire wallet just with an email and a password while not compromising the non-custodial nature of the wallet. Uh, it's also mutable uh, which means that you can change the authentication scheme. Like you can start with, uh, with a seedless onboarding account where you have an email and a password and then as you become more versatile in crypto, you can upgrade this to a Trezor or a Ledger, uh, and you can um, 
you can set the dresser and the ledger to be like the sole owner of the account without changing the address, without having to move funds, which is amazing. Uh, then you have gas abstractions, which allows, which allow you to pay for transactions in stable coins. Uh, so like if you're a new user onboarding uh, on crypto, you, uh, to crypto, you can sign up uh, with an email and a password, then uh, fund your account with uh, an on ramp, and then you would receive USDT, and you would be able to swap that, for example, for Ether without having Ether for gas. Uh, and of course, you can batch transactions, so do multiple things in, uh, in one transaction. Uh, again, a fantastic example from Argent was the NFT shopping cart, but a simpler example would be on Uniswap when you have an approval, the approval would get batched together with, uh, with the transaction, so uh, you wouldn't have to do it separately. Uh, and there are more exotic use cases, like for example, uh, custom cri cryptography, like uh, enabling the NIST curve, uh, which would allow using iOS biometrics and web authentication. Um, and there are, there are, of course, some drawbacks of smart wallets and some adoption challenges. Um, like we have uh, gas overhead. Um, as, mentioned pre as mentioned previously, it's not so much as people think. Uh, you just have around one to 2,000 gas per transaction uh, and around 40,000 gas for deployment, which is added to your first transa transaction. Uh, but the main challenge is uh, DAP adoption, so a lot of DAPs uh, either block smart contracts intentionally because they believe that that's not a wallet and it's a, some sort of automation. Uh, that's basically what NFT means. And the other thing is many DAPs just don't implement smart contract signing, but this is quite easy to fix. Um, so when would you want to use uh, MPC wallets? So one of the benefits of MPC wallets is off-chain recovery, which is cheaper and easier, but not as flexible. Uh, then the other thing is uh, they're truly cross-chain, so there's no dependence on smart contracts. So for example, you can support Bitcoin or you can support basically any chain that uses uh, elliptic curve signatures. Um, there's no gas overhead. Uh, and there's no uh, kind of drama with the signatures, like signatures just work with any DAP. Uh, but there are some problems with MPC, uh, and one of those is that they require custom cryptography. Uh, and there are not that many libraries so far, and they're not that uh, well battle tested as normal elliptic curve signature libraries. And it's kind of an experimental technology. But then the main problem, I think, is the immutable authentication rules, uh, which basically means that when you create, like, for example, a two out of three multisig, you cannot just swap out one of the signers. Uh, you cannot make it like a two out of four, or you cannot make it like a three out of four. It's just immutable. Like, once you create it, that's it. Uh, which also creates some problems with recovery, right? So you can recover the account once, but then you can change one of the keys. So like if you lost the key, uh, then it's kind of bad. Um, and uh, it's also limited to multisig. You don't have time locks, so that, a lot, that limits you a lot as well. There's no gas abstractions, but that's not in the slide because it's more of a benefit of smart contract wallets. And finally, the, also a very big thing, you cannot use it with a hardware wallet, at least not before those hardware wallets implement that. Of course, you can argue that you can pull requests to those hardware wallets, but at the moment you can't. And uh, as a conclusion, I would say that smart contracts and account abstractions are the way to go. Uh, that's the future-proof way of doing accounts on Ethereum and on other EVM chains, on layer tools, and etc. cetera. Uh, but multi-party computation can be fantastic for like some temporary use cases before dApps kind of get their stuff together. Um, but yeah, definitely smart contract uh, wallets are um, way better for the future. So uh, that's it. So uh, one of the critiques for the um, uh, smart contract wallets right now is that in the end, you still need a wallet with a private key to manage it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Both on DAOs and multi six. So how do I mean any any ideas of how of how to overcome it? Well, that's completely true. But like on a fundamental level, we cannot get away from the secret, right? In any form of authentication, you have some sort of a secret. Just the great thing about smart contract wallets is, is that you can manage it and you can make it work not like as a single private key, which is like the source of all authentication and like the one true point of authentication. But you can have multiple of those secrets, like a regular, uh, like like you have on, for example, on Google or on Facebook or on regular like human friendly. Uh, authentication scheme. So it is a private key, but you shouldn't think of it as a private key because EOA wallets, in, there the private key is king. It's like the single secret number where everything comes from, unlike smart contract wallets.